Professor C.T. Arvind Kumar, Vice Chancellor, very Reverend Dr. James Parakal, Reverend Dr. Thomas Joseph, the principal, students, faculty members, and all the distinguished guests in the audience today. Illavirikam and Devanida Maya Namaskaram. I must say that uh, I was delighted to be joining you on this beautiful morning to commemorate 75 years of excellence of Assumption College, Changina Sheri. In many ways, it's a morning full of hope and promise, the promise of a future even more glorious than the past we have gathered here to commemorate. No sooner did I set foot on your campus than my eyes fell on Assumption's inspiring coat of arms, a lotus-shaped shield in which, above a glistening ocean of wisdom, overhung by clouds, three icons loom large. Chief amongst these is a majestic crown, much like the papal tiara, which symbolizes the urge to seek the kingdom of God first. That assumption is ever since its founding in 1950, by the Archdiocese of Changanasheri instilled this very urge in its remarkably talented students, empowering them to partake in the glory of God is evident. Above this crest is emblazoned Assumption College's powerful Latin motto, Sursum Corda, or lift up your hearts. Now this crest and motto together convey I've been given to understand that all of us, regardless of our status in society, our faith, language, and so on, are pilgrims on earth, sailing on the sea of life, with those heavy clouds acting as our guides, leading us towards a heavenly shore. This creed of equality and humility is very profound indeed, and makes it amply clear that from the very beginning, Assumption has sought to distribute the radiance of the torch of knowledge amongst our fellow citizens, especially for most of the 75 years, our women, who otherwise, in many ways, have been otherwise steeped in ignorance. In fact, I was struck when Archbishop Mar Thomas Tarayel mentioned the very name of Assumption. I'm sure you all know what the assumption is. It is the idea that upon her passing, the body of the Holy Virgin Mary was assumed to merge into her soul in heaven. That is the assumption, the assuming that the body merged into the soul. And yes, he is right that some people contest this because there is no scriptural reference to it, nothing in the in the Bible, nothing in the New Testament, there are references in Genesis and Revelation that speak about the heavenly nature of the Virgin Mary, but nothing specifically makes this particular dogmatic claim. And so some Christian denominations do not accept it, but for the Catholic Church, it is a basic dogma, the assumption. The other interesting thing for us in India is what the date of the assumption is. It is August 15th, the date of our independence. So a special holy day is for all of you the name of your college, but the moment of our nation's independence has also been sanctified by the assumption of Mary. And as you know, the word assumption has another meaning when you assume something. In fact, it's the more common meaning than the assumption that was used in the title. They use the word assumption for Mary because the word ascension had already been taken for Jesus Christ. The ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven and the assumption of Mary to heaven. So these are some of the interesting linguistic issues and challenges. I, I, as you can see, I, I rather enjoy delving into the meanings of words. And so for me, having just authored a book about it called A Wonderland of Words, 
I was very struck when the Archbishop mentioned that the word assumption itself in the name of your college has excited some comment and discussion about its meanings. Now, I'm very, very grateful to be here and I want to thank everybody on stage for having invited me. Uh, born of the vision to empower the women of Central Travancore through education, Assumption College has soared to phenomenal heights over the past 75 years. Not long after its founding, Assumption rapidly emerged as a citadel of scholastic brilliance, dedicated to imparting quality education to young women and endowing them with such skills and expertise as were required in a newly independent India on the cusp of sweeping technological and industrial change and transformation. This year, with the introduction of the four-year undergraduate program, I see Assumption has become a co-educational institution and that there are many young men here in the class and that, therefore, the dazzling lamp of knowledge will sparkle brighter still. I'm impressed, too, and since we are here to celebrate 75 years, I think it's worth mentioning that the recognition of your top-class facilities and outstanding academic rigor is widespread. Assumption College has received a number of accolades, among these the R. Shankar Award, the Sister Teresa Award, the MG University Award, the Bharatiya Shiksha Ratan Award, the Gyan Bharati Shiksha Award, and for exceptionally pursuing women empowerment through education and entrepreneurship, the Educational Excellence Award. Because of all these distinctions and more, it can safely be said that Assumption College glitters as a rare gem amongst the many institutions of higher learning that we in Kerala can boast of. Indeed, I'm struck that in terms of the best sports and co-curricular education institution, Assumption came third in India and first in Kerala in the education world Grand Jury India Higher Education Rankings in 21-22, a highly commendable feat. It understands that education is not only in the classroom, that the sports field and the co-curricular activities are equally important. In fact, Assumption College's stellar sporting record speaks for itself. Not only was it the first institution to receive the Kerala State Sports Council's G.V. Raja Award, it also won this Hallow Award again in 1516. What's more, Assumption has won the Rajiv Gandhi Gold Trophy for the overall championship in college games five times over and has also landed the Malayala Manorama Trophy for the best sports performing college for an uninterrupted and heady 10 years from 2009 to 2019. Cricket fans will compare that to Mumbai's string of victories in the Ranji Trophy. Amazing. No wonder then that the alumni of Assumption College include amongst their ranks Asian Games gold medal winners and even Olympians as also sportswomen at the national and international levels. Today, having completed 75 splendid years, Assumption College stands at the threshold of a new dawn a new future, a new era, given its formidable track record thus far. And I have absolutely no doubt that the best is yet to come for Assumption, and we can all be assured that in many ways, numerous graduates from this seminal institution will go on to shape Kerala's and India's future. So I look out across the chamber at your faces, aglow with anticipation of a wondrous tomorrow, both for yourselves and for our country. And I'm overcome with the realization that in this very auditorium sits the future of our nation, young men and women who will go on to sculpt India's destiny. Therefore, I had come prepared with a very long speech, but I'm not going to read it to you. I would rather talk about the future because there I think Archbishop Tariel's remarks provoked me into some observations that I would like to share with you, and that might be more relevant than giving you a formal lecture. The time has also gone well beyond what we had planned, and so it is best that I keep myself brief and to the point. 
Archbishop Tariel said, don't bother to study some subjects, go and study agriculture. He quoted someone as saying that. He said it with a smile. But this is the kind of concern that many people have today. Why is that so? It is because the world of work is changing with dizzying rapidity, thanks to technology. You know, for our generation, Mr. Perinthotam, the Archbishop Tarayal is a bit younger than me, but for Archbishop Perinthotam, myself, a few others around our time, we have witnessed changes we could not have imagined when we were in school. None of us could have imagined that one day we would hold in our hands an instrument which has the entire computing power of the Apollo 11 computers that went first time to send the man to the moon in 1969. It took a whole room full of computers in Houston to send the Apollo 11 to the moon. Today, the computing power available then is in our hands. We can search for information about anything in the world at any time. If we have forgotten a fact or a figure, it is just a click away. If we look at the way in which I went to America as a graduate student and I could not afford to speak to my parents because it was $12 a minute to call my mother or my father. I would have to write laborious letters and post it to them and wait one week or two weeks for their reply. Today, you can not only telephone anywhere in the world, you can do it for free and you can see their faces as well if you use WhatsApp or a similar program. Look how the world has changed in our lifetime. And this is something we could not have expected. But for you young people in this college and graduating from this college, the changes will be even more rapid and bewilderingly so. I will give you an example. <coughs> I will give you an example. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a new profession. In fact, there were a whole bunch of new professions coming into existence because of the computer and internet revolution. You may remember, well, you may not remember because you were very young then, you may not even have been born then, but in the late 1990s, there was a big scare. It was called the Y2K scare. What was that scare? That all the computers in the world that people had just got used to having, they had two-digit dates. And that after 1999, because only 99 would come, 00 would come and all the computers in the world would crash. That was the fear. So what happened was, urgently, internet cables, undersea cables were laid all the way across the world, mainly to India. And a whole bunch of Indian software engineers was busy in programming and reprogramming all the software of all the computers in the world so that instead of two digits, it will be four digits. Instead of zero, zero, it will be 2,000, and the computers would not crash. Now, this turned out to be a big success. Maybe the scare was not even justified. Nobody's computer crashed. Everything went on as normal. But in the process, we suddenly had this huge internet capacity which had been built at express speed with all these cables under the sea. And as a result, new professions came into being. Suddenly people realized that thanks to the internet, work could be done in India or even beyond India up to the Philippines while Americans were sleeping and that Americans could benefit from the expertise of young educated Indians. So one of the new professions that were born in the early years of the 21st century was a profession called medical transcription. And do you know what medical transcription was? Very simple. An American doctor would see his patients in America and he would have to dictate his notes about the patient. So he would have an up-to-date file. If the patient came back six months later, eight months later, he would be able to look up the file and remember the details of the patient, the case, the diagnosis, the prescriptions. But Dictating the notes was a time-consuming job. At the end of his day, he would have to dictate it to his secretary. She was not so well-educated, that's why she was just a secretary. 
So she would type it up, it would make mistakes, it would take some time. On top of that, he would have to then correct the mistakes. Meanwhile, the next day's patients had come. Meanwhile, the secretary needed a salary, needed leave, could fall sick, would need to be absent. All of these things meant that it was an onerous task for the American doctor. So somebody said, why do we worry about this now? Thanks to the internet, the American doctor can dictate his notes into a machine. He can zing it across by computer, by internet to India. Indians with a basic medical education would receive it when they woke up in the morning and the American doctor is sleeping at night. They would type up the notes and when the American doctor came back to work the next morning, he would get the notes fully typed up and ready and he would get them in record time because no American secretary was going to type it overnight. On top of that, the Indians cost very much less than the American secretary. What a brilliant idea. Medical transcription started booming. We hired tens of thousands of Indians to do medical transcription. Every doctor in America was saving lots of money and even more important, saving time by sending their notes to India. But then what happened? The boom lasted just a few years. Our people were so optimistic, they opened so many companies. Madras, Chennai alone had 20 companies doing nothing but medical transcriptions. Young people thought their careers were set for life. They were taking home loans and car loans and planning for a long future. But in less than 10 years, the entire dream burst because Artificial intelligence powered voice recognition software was invented and the doctor no longer needed to send his notes to India. He would speak into his computer and as he spoke for the price of one time software, his words would appear before his very eyes on the screen. And this artificial intelligence empowered software was self correcting. So if it made a mistake once or twice, the third time it would get it right on the basis of the doctor's corrections. End of story, all the doctors canceled their contracts with Indians, medical transcription companies started collapsing. The entire job that many people thought would go on for decades started and finished and was over in less than 10 years. That is the reality of today's artificial intelligence world. There is a study done by the Oxford Martin School which says that one third, 30 percent of the jobs in the world in 2030, that will be when you are all looking for work, 30 percent of the jobs in the world in 2030 will be jobs that do not exist today. Now how do your teachers prepare you for a job that does not exist? Well, whenever I address teachers, I give them one simple piece of advice. Do not teach your students what to think. Teach them how to think. There could be no more important lesson in today's world of education. The old days when I was a student and we all had textbooks and lectures based on those textbooks and we had to mug up these texts and regurgitate them in the examinations, that was out of date already when I was a student, but it is completely out of date today. Yes, maybe I can quote lines of Shakespeare or great poetry that you may not be able to quote. But anything that I can remember or might have forgotten, you can check on your mouse or on your phone very quickly. You don't need a mind full of facts. You don't need a well-filled mind which is what the old education system used to give you. What you need is a well-formed mind. A well-formed mind is a mind that knows how to approach a problem, that knows how to grapple with it, that knows how to divine a path towards understanding where you can find a solution, and that has the sense of enterprise to go out and find a solution. That is the kind of mind that people are looking for in the world of work. So tomorrow, if we are looking for employment, it is the habits of mind that an employer is interested in. It may not just be your marks 
in your examinations. They'll want to talk to you, see how you react when you are confronted with an unfamiliar problem. How do you approach a, a difficulty you've never heard of before? How do you find a way to figuring out an answer? Those are the kinds of challenges that await us all. And yes, in fact, I was talking to the vice chancellor who remarked that these days he found there were still a lot of students going to the social sciences. And I applaud that. I have no problem with that. I myself am a history honors graduate. I believe the study of history has taught me about the world, has taught me the world is not just made of blacks and whites, but there are very many complicated shades of gray, that there are nuances to life and to human behavior that you can understand by studying the past. The study of liberal arts in general predisposes people to appreciating nuance, appreciating human nature, appreciating sometimes the importance of irrationality. Whereas the days when everybody only wanted to study engineering and science, that is no longer, I'm afraid, very good. First of all, the organization that I used to lead in the Congress party, which I founded, the All India Professionals Congress, did a study amongst engineering graduates in Kerala. And we found that 66% of Kerala engineering graduates were today in jobs that did not require an engineering degree. Can you imagine what a wasted education their parents put them through? Either their engineering degree was irrelevant to the job market or the level of skills and the up-to-date skills required by the job market had simply not been imparted in the classroom. And so they ended up in other kinds of jobs. Engineering jobs are not available to them. So there again, what Archbishop Tariel said is important. See what the world needs. And I must admit that while science is important, research is important, matters that involve the application of human intelligence are no longer to be taken for granted as things that only we can do. He mentioned coding. Why is it you should not do coding? Because now people are writing artificial intelligence programs that will write code faster, better, and more perfectly than you can. When I became an MP, I remember inaugurating coding classes, encouraging young people to take up coding as a great profession. He's right. It no longer is a great profession. So what you need to do now is to think about the things that only you can do. You know, when you mentioned agriculture, I was reminded of the fact that I once joked, at least those who learn Ayurvedic massage will be safe, because surely nobody can do Ayurvedic massage as well as a human being. And then some, somebody told me, not true. We are now creating such sophisticated robots. They can give you a better Ayurvedic massage with more precise location of pressure points on the body than any human being can be trained to do. So even that skill may now be replaced by a machine. Now, in an ideal world, machines will do all this work and we will enjoy a life of leisure, of art, of theater, of cinema, of music, of culture. But we don't live in an ideal world. We have to earn a salary. Somebody has to pay us and no one is going to pay us for enjoying life. We will need to have a salary to be able to support our family, bring up our children, look after the future. And therefore, we need to orient ourselves to think in ways that are invaluable in any profession, to be prepared to adjust to change, and to always be ready to embrace the future with an open mind. That is the challenge before all of you. I am confident that with the 75-year history of Assumption College, where you have done so much within the existing parameters of education in those days, that you will be equally adept at embracing the future. I'd like to congratulate once more everyone on stage on this wonderful occasion of the 75th anniversary of Assumption College. Thank you for providing me this platform and my very best wishes and good luck 
for the years to come, for the next quarter century before we can celebrate the centenary. Jai Hind!